Okay, now we're going to go on to module three, and module three is all about nipple discharge. When we talk about nipple discharge, first we want to describe what do we mean by nipple discharge and what is a concerning discharge. Like we began speaking about at the very beginning of module one, we know that the normal breast is basically designed to make fluids, i.e. milk. So when is a discharge normal and when is it concerning? A concerning discharge is serous or bloody, not milky, and it should come from one duct not many ducts. We know that there are eight to 20 lobes in the breast and each one will have an orifice on the nipple surface. So there are many possible orifices for discharge to come out of. If discharge is coming out of many orifices, that means that it, there's just a condition, a benign condition in that breast causing that. But if it's coming out of one orifice, that may reflect that there is a process happening in one ductal system, like a cancer. So if we have serous or bloody discharge from one duct orifice, that's more concerning. Thirdly, a concerning discharge is one which is spontaneous and profuse. If there is a cancer causing it, then it's not going to go away. It's going to keep coming. And also, if the um, discharge is spontaneous, then the patient will sometimes find a spot on the nightgown or on her bra, and that tells us that this is not being expressed, but spontaneous. Most nipple discharges are benign, whether they're serous or bloody, and the numbers tell us that serous discharges are over 90% benign, whereas bloody 80 plus percent benign. So while they are both overwhelmingly benign, the bloody has just a slightly greater chance of being caused by cancer, which is why we worry about it. The main differential diagnosis here is papilloma versus cancer. Most of these concerning discharges are caused by papillomas, but cancer can sometimes cause them. Among the benign things that will cause this kind of discharge is ductectasia and fibrocystic change. Okay, now we're gonna talk about papillomas. The key facts are that there are basically two types. The one that is mainly responsible for nipple discharge is the solitary subareolar papilloma. The other type is the multiple peripheral. These are usually smaller, uh, more in the periphery of the breast, and these carry a higher risk uh, of other incidental malignancies. Both of these are usually non-palpable and they may, although rarely, present on a screening mammogram or with nipple discharge. They will usually present with discharge before they are easily visible on imaging because the symptom of discharge will proceed a larger size. On imaging, like I say, it's typically negative or we might see a small mass. Sometimes a papilloma, like a sclerosing papilloma, may become calcified. Uh, so both of these peripheral and central subareolar types may have calcifications, and they can be in various patterns, but usually punctate or heterogeneous, sometimes coarse with time. Dilated ducts we usually only see with the solitary subareolar type. And interestingly, the dilatation of the duct is downstream, i.e. between the papilloma and the nipple. And that's just because the papilloma is making the discharge and filling the duct and distending it. It's not a um, upstream backup phenomenon. It's not as though the papilloma makes a dam because the Peripheral duct isn't generating a lot of fluid. The papilloma is generating the fluid, so the dilatation is downstream toward the nipple. On ultrasound, we're going to see, if we see anything, an intracystic mass or an intraductal mass. If we choose to do ductography, we may see uh, just an obstruction or an actual filling defect if the contrast gets around the papilloma enough to outline it. If we do MRI, we're going to see an enhancing subareolar mass. Here's an example of a patient that had bloody nipple discharge caused by a papilloma. 
the BB is on her nipple. We see subnipple tissue here, but not uh, anything very discreet until we look more closely here and we see this tiny irregular mass. And we go to ultrasound and we see here a small cystic structure. We see the fluid around and then a small solid mass within that. So this could be a lactiferous sinus or a cystic dilatation of the duct with a little intraductal or intracystic papilloma. Here is a different patient um, with a large filling defect in a central duct. This is what I call the holy grail of nipple discharge just because it's what we're seeking, it's what we're looking for in a patient with discharge. We hope we're going to find this, but we don't usually see findings this definite. Usually we see nothing on sonography in people with discharge. But here is a very big papilloma obstructing this duct here, causing some dilatation. Here you see the papilloma in the more dilated lactiferous sinus under the nipple here, and you see it kind of branching a little bit into the smaller duct branches there. Very nice image of a papilloma. So we used to teach that a solitary incidental dilated duct is of no consequence on screening mammography. But recent literature, although the numbers are small, has shown a 10% incident of ductal carcinoma in situ associated with a solitary dilated subareolar duct. So this is in the new BIRADS manual, the 2013 BIRADS manual. So just something to keep in mind, if you do see on screening a solitary dilated duct, you might want to bring that patient back and work it up to make sure there's not some DCIS there. Sometimes we do ductography. This is what it looks like. It's helpful for me to have this example to show you so I can illustrate what the normal ductal system looks like. Here is the catheter with the ductography cannula placed in the nipple and contrast filling the subareolar duct and then the extensive branching system here. But you can see that all the ducts have smooth walls. They're thin in caliber. They branch nicely. So this is what the normal ductal system looks like. There's a couple little bubbles here. You can see on other imaging that they move. And you can also see she has a couple of clips here. She's had previous biopsies. Here's a 33-year-old who had bloody nipple discharge, so that was concerning, coming from this one ductal orifice. We did a ductogram on her. Here you see the catheter. You see the long, thin main duct here, then it branches. And then we see a lot of ill-defined rounded opacities. Here it is on the lateral view as well. And this is probably two things. It's what we call the lobular blush. And also uh, on the MRI, you'll see that this is also due to some fibrocystic change. But the lobular blush just means that the contrast has gone from the terminal duct into the lobules. And this can happen for two reasons. Number one, it could be that there's just a high pressure of injection and it forces the contrast into the lobules, which is okay, we see it on ductography. Or it could mean that there is dilatation of those lobules and the contrast flows easily into them. As in this case, she has cystic change of her lobules, so the contrast flows easily into those lobules. Here we see her MRI, and she has what we call clumped non-mass enhancement or clumped NME. Here is the non-mass enhancement. You can see it doesn't form a single mass, but it's a lot of little spots of enhancement. Uh, so we call this a clumped pattern of non-mass enhancement. And you can see that the distribution follows, I'll back up here, follows the distribution here on the mammogram of this one ductal system. And we could see on T2 that there are a lot of little T2 bright cysts here as well. So she ended up having a biopsy because this 
clumped NME pattern is something that we often see in DCIS. So she had a biopsy but has only fibrocystic change and no DCIS. This is a 42 year old who has serous nipple discharge on the left side. So serous, profuse spontaneous discharge being one of the suspicious discharges, we work it up. She had had a prior benign biopsy near the nipple, hence the little biopsy clip here. The mammogram was called negative, but it's very dense as you can see. So it might be that a small mass is obscured even on the spot magnification view under the nipple here. So what's our next step? Well, it depends. Different institutions may work this up differently. In some places they will go to MRI and that's because MRI gives us the most information. It has the highest sensitivity for cancers and it shows us all the ductal systems and all the breast tissue. But it's expensive and not available everywhere. So that allows some clinicians to choose either ductography or ultrasound. And ultrasound is something that is done most everywhere. So it's usually the first examination that we do. And in this particular case, what we see in her is some dilated ducts. Here's sonography just under the nipple area. And on some other images we see in one of these dilated ducts, here is a small round hypoechoic mass. Here it is in the other projection. So a small introductal mass. This is definitely consistent with the papilloma, but could be a small area of DCIS. So we're going to do a biopsy. And I like to do vacuum core biopsies of these because if I use a spring-loaded 14 gauge needle, once I poke at it a couple of times, it becomes difficult to see and then I'm not as confident about how well I biopsied it. But if I'm doing a vacuum core biopsy, I can position the small nodule directly in my sampling trough and I can watch the cutter sampling it and if it disappears on the first pass that's fine because I can see that I have biopsied it. It was sitting right in the trough. So this was diagnosed as a papilloma on vacuum core biopsy. So while ultrasound has a fairly low yield, we don't usually see anything in the ducts. Sometimes it's helpful, sometimes we do see something and we can make the diagnosis like this, which is why we usually do ultrasound. This is a different patient, a 60 year old who had bloody nipple discharge. Her mammogram was challenging, as you can see, it's kind of patchy in its density, uh, but it had been, it was stable, had been called negative in the past, we called it negative again, nothing really showed up here. So what's the next step? Well, we're gonna start with ultrasound because it's available, it's harmless, unless we find incidental findings that are benign, and it's fairly inexpensive. So here's her ultrasound. It just shows some minimally dilated ducts, but otherwise normal tissue. So not terribly helpful in her. So, now what, do we need to do something more? Well, because we are a teaching institution at UCSF, we did a sonogram, I'm sorry, a ductogram. And we do a ductogram because number one, we want to teach our trainees how to do it. And it can identify the cause of a discharge and it can help localize it for the surgeon if we're not going to go to MRI. So in order for a ductogram to be successful, we need discharge that is profuse and spontaneous and comes from a single duct. And if we have these three factors, then that means there is going to be a big duct, a dilated duct. And that means it's going to be possible to cannulate it and we'll be able to get some contrast in and see something. If it's the kind of situation where the patient can just squeeze out a drop every now and then, it's going to be nearly impossible to do a successful ductogram. And it's also probably not a discharge that's being caused by anything significant or else the discharge would be more profuse and spontaneous. So here's an example of a patient with a mammogram that shows a small non-specific mass. We do ductography 
and you see the cannula here entering the nipple. We see the contrast coming in, the lactiferous sinus here, and then boom, it hits an obstruction. Here's a filling defect, kind of a lobular filling defect, and the contrast does get past the obstruction, so we see the distal duct. But this is a um, filling defect, which is an intraductal papilloma causing her discharge. What's the differential diagnosis for bloody nipple discharge? Well, we talked a lot about papillomas, but also carcinoma and the variety of carcinoma that presents as bloody nipple discharge is usually a high grade DCIS. Here we see an example of the mammogram. You see a large regional area of pleomorphic calcifications. Here's the mag view that shows the calcifications have very different sizes and shapes. You can see that the calcifications come right down to the nipple here. Here's one actually in the nipple. So you can imagine that with all this DCIS, there can be necrosis and bleeding in the duct walls, which will then come out as bloody nipple discharge. So that's the end of our nipple discharge module. Thank you very much, and we'll move on to the next module shortly.